And then I just want to share some thoughts that have uh, been on my heart. Um, you know, some weeks you get up and you preach and you might be teaching something for, a, you know, picked a topic and so on. And sometimes you look around and you just get a feel for, okay, let's go here, go there. Every now and then you have something that's sort of dropped into your heart and you just know that you know that, okay, this is a, not only is this uh, uh, biblical, but there's a, there's, a, there's a moment why this has to happen now. And so I want to just share something this morning, and I want to present it to you as one of those times. I just really felt like God dropped this into my heart earlier this week, and I've tried to get away from it because I'd rather preach about other things, but uh, this is what's there. So I I just pray that you open up your heart, you receive from God what he wants to say to you this morning. And uh, so Lord, we do, we open our hearts right now. Father, we pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you lead us on our journey of discipleship, God? Help us to grow more and more in love with you, more in love with people, Lord. Help us connect all the dots of what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ in 2022. Father, in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Hey, anyone ever read this verse? And Jesus said unto Peter, come forth and you shall receive eternal glory. But Peter came fifth and won only a toaster. Anyone ever heard that? You've never read that in your Bible? No, because it's not there. I just thought it sounded really, really cool and fits in a little bit with what I want to talk about today. If you've got a Bible there, can you please turn to John chapter 7? We're going to have a look at verse 37 to 39. We'll kick off from here. John 7, 37 to 39. I'll be reading from the New King James version this morning. And as David has pointed out, that means I should be called Reverend Allen. I don't know why, but apparently if you read from the New King James, you have become a reverend. Personally, I prefer right honourable reverend, um, but then Dave said you've got to actually be right and honourable, so I'll just accept reverend for now. Uh, John seven thirty seven to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I love, I love the fact that We don't serve a God who literally just says, now you're saved, sit back, I'll do everything. You you, you don't need to work, you don't need to make decisions, you just sit back now and I've got it all. Jesus said, I'm here, Jesus has already come, but he said, now your part now is you've got to come to me. I've come, here I am, I'm living amongst you, I'm walking amongst you, but you still have to play your part and you still got to come to me. And if you're thirsty... If anyone's thirsty, hand up if you fit into the bracket of anyone. Is there any anyone's here? There's five of you. Awesome. Great response today. I can tell this is going in a good direction. Five anyone's. Well, the rest of you just listen along and, and you, might, you might pick it up somewhere there. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. In the Greek, it actually says, if anyone thirsts, let him keep coming to me. It's a continual sense. You don't just come to me once and drink. You, you keep coming back to me. You keep coming back to me. I, I, I fell in love with my wife at, at, at a point nearly 30 years ago, and I didn't just fall in love with her once and express my love to her and, and have a relationship with her, and then, okay, gone, that's it. No, no, I, I keep coming back to my wife. I keep building into this relationship. I keep, you're looking at me waiting for the, cat, for the catch, aren't you? There's no catch today. I'm just expressing my love for you. There's no side tracks here, rabbit holes. I just love you. But I keep coming back and I keep building into that relationship. And, and here's what, what Jesus is saying. If anyone thirsts, come to me and keep coming to me. Have a relationship with me. Build a relationship with me. Go on journey with me. Go on mission with me. Let's do life together. Not just me as a figurehead or an idea or a philosophy, but me as an active living part of your life. Come to me if anyone thirsts and I'll give him drink. And then he says this statement. He says, he who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. It says there, he who believes in me as the scriptures had said, out of his belly and so on. You can interpret that one of two ways. When Jesus says, as the scripture has said, is he talking about the previous statement or the next statement? 
Is he saying, believe in, he who believes in me as the scripture has said. In other words, believe in me as the word of God tells you I am. Not as culture tells you. Not as whatever is on trend tells you. Not as whatever is most comfortable tells you. No, no. As these ancient documents tell you, as these writers that walked and lived with him, as, as, as these things that the Holy Spirit moved upon the heart of men to record and to write down, as these things speak of me, you've got to believe in me that way. I am who this word of God says I am. So you can interpret it that way. He who believes in me as the scripture has said. Or you could be tempted to believe the other way. He who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, the correct way to interpret that, I believe, is the first one. Jesus is saying, he who believes in me as the scripture has said. Because the second statement is not exactly what the scripture said. So Jesus is quoting a whole bunch of verses, primarily in Isaiah, when he says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Isaiah speaks often of God giving water to Israel, giving water to his people, right? So, so there's this reference of giving water, but Jesus tweaks it a little bit, and don't miss the change. He says, out of his heart will flow living water. So Jesus is not talking about what God is going to give to you and put in you. He's saying, if you believe in me, as the scripture has said, it's not just what comes into you, it's what's coming out of you. It's what's going to come out of you. See, the, the Christian life is not just about getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Anyone know spiritual storm chasers? You ever met a spiritual storm chaser? You know? Yep, they just run from this meeting to that meeting. Oh, this guy's in that church. We're following him to there. And, and, and we're chasing the next experience with God. We're running everywhere we can because we want the next goosebump. We want the next word. We want the next this. We want, and, and we run around. It's like chasing a storm, like storm chasers chasing that rush, that experience. They've got to be there as the storm comes and the event happens and be a part of it. And there are people spiritually that that's what their spiritual life is about. It's this constant coming to drink. And Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me. So that's true. But what Jesus said here is that's not the end game. He said, the end game is not that you, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. He said, the end game is that you get so full that, uh, that rivers of living water, being the Holy Spirit, flows out of you for the benefit of others. It, it's got, God, God wants to so overflow us so that then he can begin to use us to make a difference in the world around us and the, and, and the lives of the people around us. So the goal of the Christian life is not to chase another touch from the Spirit, but to be a conduit for the Spirit to flow through. This is what Jesus is saying. If you come to me, if you come to me as the Scriptures say, if you come to me and you believe that I am who the Scriptures say, if I'm everything that the Word tells you, if you come to me and know that I am that one, the Redeemer of your soul, the lover of your soul, the forgiver of your sins, the, the, the one that paid, if you come to me and believe all that, the one that gives you the Spirit, if you come and believe all that, the end game is not just that you keep getting and get another goosebump. The end game is that you get so overflowed that that very living water, the Spirit himself, flows out of you. That's the goal. The goal is for the Spirit to flow out of you, for you to become a conduit for the Holy Spirit. But the point here he's making is this, that the Spirit will flow out of us. The Spirit will not be able to flow out of us and freely and fully flow through us until Jesus is glorified by us. He says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But then he says, I'm talking about the Spirit, but the Spirit had not yet been given. Why? Because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. Jesus had to be glorified in order for the Spirit to be poured out. Jesus had to be glorified in order for the Holy Spirit to come and to fill us and to be poured out upon the earth. Before that happens, before the Spirit flows, Jesus has to be glorified. Amen? Jesus had to be glorified. Now, I believe this. We're all filled with the Spirit. I have no doubt about that. If you have given your life to Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can scripturally take you through why I believe that, even if you don't speak in tongues. I don't want to offend anyone, but even if you don't speak in tongues, I believe that if you come to Christ in faith, that he pours his Spirit out upon you, I believe you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe you're sealed with the Holy Spirit for salvation. But we're not all seeing the Spirit flowing through us to the degree that we believe and know and want, are we? We know we've got the Spirit, but the truth is there are many dry people there going, but I just do not feel like this life of God flows out of me for whatever particular reason. And I just want to leave you with one thought, one thing to think about today. Who are you living to bring glory to? 
See, the Holy Spirit flows most freely and fully in environments and lives where God himself is the focus of the glory, not you, not me, not man. God wants glory, doesn't he? God wants to be glorified. And when we say things like, give God the glory, anyone ever heard that? Let's give God the glory. It's, it's almost can sound a little bit like, so hang on a second, so, so God is lacking something and we're giving it to him. Is that what that means? Like God doesn't have glory, so I'll, like my children need lunch money and they don't have lunch money, so give the children the lunch money. So now the children have something that I've given them that they never had access to before. It's not like that. God, God doesn't need glory from us because it fills a deficit in his glory box. You know what I mean? It's like there's just not enough there. Will you guys just give me some more? And he's not an egomaniac either. God is God. But the Holy Spirit flows most freely and fully in environments and lives where God himself is the focus of the glory, which is very, very, uh, it's almost the antithesis of a lot of what we even hear in church spaces today, where it almost sounds like God exists to serve us, not us to serve God. It's almost like, in some cases, the, 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 in order to impress upon the world how much God loves us, and let me tell you something, we cannot speak enough of the love of God for humanity. I cannot impress upon you enough how much God loves you. I don't have human words adequate enough to even touch the tip of the iceberg of the love and affection that God has for each person in this room. But I can't flip the script and say that God loves you so much that he becomes subservient to you and will give you and do whatever it is... You, so, so you just tell God that this is what I want my life to look like. I want everyone to praise me and think I'm wonderful and successful and great. And God, if you will do that. It doesn't work like that. Jesus, God is the one that needs to be glorified. Now that word glory, like, let's talk for a second about glorify. What does it mean? In, in, in the, the, one of the Greek dictionaries there I've got, the word glorify means this. To consider excellent, to honour, to acknowledge and manifest the dignity and worth of someone. So, so to, to consider God excellent, to honour God, to acknowledge and manifest or reveal the dignity and worth of God. Another one was John Piper or Timothy Keller. I can't remember who said this, but they uh, reworded it and put it this way. That to glorify God means to make clear to others what God is like so as to seek their praise and admiration of him. Let me say that again. To make clear to others what God is like so that they will direct their praise and their admiration towards God. Not towards me, not towards you, but that they would give their praise and adoration, God would, towards God. That's what it literally means, to glorify God. To to, to live in such a way, my words, my actions, my everything about me is is pointing people to God. Now, you're never going to stop people from praising you and looking at you and thinking, aren't you wonderful? You're not, and if people think you're great, I'm not saying that you should go, oh, 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 I'm a worm, but a man, no, no. That's not pride. Pride is being known for who you are. And guess what? You're pretty awesome at a lot of things, aren't you? Pauline's not sure there. She didn't want to, she was like, she wanted to go. And then she looked around at the rest of you and went, oh, better not. They'll think I'm proud. No, no. Be known for who you are. And some of us are great at some things and better at others. And stuff, and that's okay. Nothing wrong with it. The guys up here playing the music, they're good at what they do. They're great at what they do. Um, I'm not. So I shan't be known as someone that's great up here playing music. But these guys shall be known as that. And it's not pride. They're good at what they do. It's awesome. And people are good uh, at, at all kinds of different things. But when them flowers, when that praise and that comes my way, really in my heart, am I grabbing hold of it? And going, that's for me? Or am I looking for ways to gently deflect it to God? Because God is the one that we're called to glorify. Now, this might be a foreign concept to a Western church that's placed man at the center of the whole spiritual narrative of eternity. But God has always been about his own glory. Psalm 106, verse 7 to 8. It says, our fathers in Egypt, David writes this, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, the great things, God, that you did for Israel. The way you set them free, the way you led them, you provided for them. They didn't understand it all, but they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he being God saved them. Why? For his name's sake. For his name's sake. Now, did he love them? Yes. Did Did he want to see them set free? Yes. Did he want to provide for them? Yes. But why did he do it? It says here that David acknowledged, God, you did all those great things. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you did it for your own namesake. 
The glory doesn't stop here. It, it, it stops there. The glory goes there. Israel would not, uh, not that Israel would be glorified for their great faith, but that God would be glorified for his great faithfulness. Amen? When we look at the story of Israel, we know that Israel's faith was not great. It was up, down, up, down. It was like the stock market. Who's got stock market faith in this room? It's you know, interest rate faith. My faith's like interest rates at the moment. It's going up. You know? It's going up. But they were not glorified for their great faith. The whole story is to glorify God for his great faithfulness, even when people don't have great faith. It's pointing us towards God. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, it says, I, even I, being God, am he who blots out your transgressions. Why? For my own sake. I'm blotting out your sins for my own sake and I will not remember them anymore. God, you need to be forgiven because you need to get in heaven and God so loves you, that's all true. But at the end of the day, it goes a step further than that. It's for his name's sake. He's the one that forgives. He's the ultimate God of grace that pours out forgiveness upon us no matter what we've done, where we've been, how we feel about ourselves. He says, my grace is sufficient. I will pour out forgiveness upon you if you come to me because I'm a gracious, loving and compassionate God. Isaiah 43, back a few verses, 6 and 7. He says, I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not keep them back. Speaking of his people, calling them in. He says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom what I have created, why? Is that font too small? Whom I have created, why? For my glory. Whose glory? Not theirs, not yours, not mine. He says, I've created humanity. Why? Ultimately, at the end of the day, as I love and pour out grace and compassion, everything upon them. But ultimately, the idea is that the glory doesn't stop with how great we are, but the glory goes back to him, that he would get the glory. We were created for the glory of God. Isaiah 49, verse 9, 38, sorry, 9 to 11. For my name's sake, here it is again, I will defer my anger. In other words, I'm not going to smash you like rotten pumpkins, but not because of you. I'm going to do it for me. I'm going to do it for me to display how great I am, not how great you are, because you should be smashed like pumpkins. But I don't want to go smashing pumpkins. It's not my nature. I'd rather cut out the impurities, replant you, fertilize you, and see if I can bring you back to life as a beautiful, beautiful pumpkin, if there's such a thing. And the answer to that question is, no, there's not. Pumpkins are gross. Never came about until after the fall. If you love pumpkins, we'll pray for you. For my name's sake, I'll defer my anger. And for my praise, I'll restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off. Seems to be, God seems to have a lot about himself and his own name and his own glory and praise. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned and I will not give my glory to another? Are there any anothers in this room? I am one of the anothers. And God is very clear. He doesn't want to share his glory with me. It's not his job to glorify me on the earth. It's mine to glorify him through everything that I do. And I wonder sometimes, every prophetic word that you may have received, every, every sense of the call of God, all these things that we, the promises of God, all this stuff. Sometimes I wonder whether God isn't able to fully flow through us because we haven't made that decision yet. Who do I live to bring glory to? Is my life going to be about glorifying myself or is it going to be about glorifying God? Because when we find environments where Jesus is glorified, I think that's the kind of environment where the Holy Spirit flows most freely and most fully. And I wonder, who do you live to glorify? Have you ever even thought about it? Who's the ultimate source of glory? Who are you trying to point the world to, people to? Is it God or is it not? Is the jury still out? Look at the example of Gideon in Judges chapter 7. We've got this amazing story of Gideon. And Gideon uh, in Judges chapter 6 gets called and then there's going to be a fight and he's going to battle and he's got enough people to win the battle, which, by the way, is smart if you ask me. I'm going to pick a fight with someone who's smaller than me and weaker than me. If you're bigger and tougher, I'm not going to pick a fight with you. You win before we even start, but I'm going to pick a fight with someone weaker. Why? Because I want to know that I'm going to win. 
And so Gideon has this set up where he's got enough men to actually win. He can win this battle. Now, isn't that what God wants for your life? Doesn't God want you to win? Doesn't God want you to succeed? Doesn't God want you to be happy? Doesn't God want you to be on the top? Doesn't God want you to be the head, not the tail above? Is that not what God wants for you? Yes, he does. But there's a way to get there. And here's what God says to to Gideon in Judges chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. You probably never read that in a war manual ever. Hang on, Commander, what did you just say? I'm sorry, you got too many. It's going to be a decimation. You know, give the guys a chance. Come on. Just half of you sit down and maybe you're not going to hear it because war is about winning. But God says, you have too many people. There's way too many people. And what is going to happen with the too many people? He goes on and he says uh, that, that you've got too many people for me to give the Midianites into your hands, lest Israel claim what? Glory for who? Itself against me, saying, my own hands have saved me. Look how wonderful we are. Look how awesome our army is. Look how strategically excellent we are. We're just awesome. Look, we won. And, and the thing is that God is more desirable of his own glory than he is your success. This is how important glory is to God. He wants to be the one that gets the attribution for the success of Israel in this situation. And he says, if, you, if there's an environment there where you're going to, if you're sitting back thinking you're a self-made man, you did this all for yourself, if you've got that in your heart, he says, I would rather you not succeed. Now, I wonder in that process where they get Gideon wanted to argue back, yeah, but Lord, I'd rather guarantee success than guarantee you glory. And I wonder if any of us have ever felt that way too. I'd rather guarantee, if I'm honest, I'd rather guarantee that I'm successful than guarantee that God gets the glory. Which one would you rather? Would I be prepared to lose if God got the glory? Would I be prepared to be defeated in this particular arena if God got the glory? Would I be prepared to go without if God got the glory? Interesting question. And I'm not asking for answers, but I'm asking you to think about it. How important is the glory of God to us? Are we living for the glory of God or are we still living for the glory of ourselves? God was not just interested in Israel's success. He was interested in his own glory. In fact, when God gets glory, here's the interesting thing. We usually get success. And don't mistake in success for looking like a certain picture. I think Mother Teresa was incredibly successful living in the slums of Calcutta, pouring her heart out to those people. She would have said she's very successful because she lived to give God glory. Success doesn't necessarily mean big bank accounts and many houses and cars. Success is obedience to God, knowing at the end of the day, God gets the glory. Whether I win, lose, stand up, fall, go left, go right, whatever, I'm living for the glory of God because he won't share his glory with anybody else. And he wants a people that have a heart to glorify him. And he'd go back to these ancient documents in the book of Acts, the first 30 years of church, you see a bunch of people. And and we read some of that stuff. And honestly, if you look at culturally some of the choices and decisions they make, you scratch your head and go, how can can Stephen be be, be martyred in Acts chapter 7 and then you have to leave town because you've run out of town because they're going to kill you? And it says in Acts chapter 8 that all those who were scattered went into Samaria and every other, other place they went and they preached the word of God. What makes a person lose everything because of God then run to the next town and the first thing they do is tell everybody hey I'm associated with that God that cost me everything back there unless you're living for the glory of God unless you're living for the glory of God when we get when God gets the glory we generally tend to get the most fulfilling and most successful results in our lives so what about the New Testament did Jesus echo these same sentiments you bet he did Matthew chapter 6 Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that what? They may have glory from men. He says, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. So is Jesus saying you can't do anything publicly and anybody know about it? No, because this same conversation he's having, go back a handful of verses to the same audience, he said this, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works And glorify your Father in heaven. So he's already told them, you know what? Go and do good works publicly. That's fine if God's going to get the glory. But then he goes later on and says, but don't be like these guys. They're doing it, but they're doing it for their own glory. 
It's not what you're doing. It's why are you doing it? Who are you pointing to? Who's getting the glory? Is it going to be glory to God or is it glory to self? That's the motivation. That's what he's asking about. It has to do with who's the object of the glory. He goes on further in Matthew 6, verse uh, 5. He says, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray where? Standing in synagogues on the corners of the streets. Why? That they may be seen by men. Now, Jesus prayed publicly. Remember Lazarus' tomb? Remember Jesus stands there and goes, Father, you know, uh, I know you hear me in my prayers, but I'm praying this one out loud for everybody to hear Lazarus come forth. Jesus prayed publicly. Early church prayed publicly. Nothing wrong with it, but why are you doing it? Is it for the glory of self? Or for the glory of God? What is the, who, whose glory are you calling for here? It's the heart motivation. Who do I live to glorify? God or self? God or self? So why does God want the glory? Here's the simple answer. Because ultimately, he's the answer to every question you'll ever ask. I'm not. And nor are you. But he is. He's the answer to questions you don't even know how to formulate yet. He's the answer to questions you've never heard before. And God wants glory because ultimately at the end of the day, he is the one that can transform a human heart, change a life, bring fulfillment, peace, contentment into a human being. He fashioned us. He formed us. He made us for his glory. He knows how to bring about the best for us. Ultimately, God is the answer to every question that we'll ever ask. And you know what, I think it's time that, maybe it's time that as a church, and I speak in general in the West, we need to learn how to give glory to God and not draw glory to ourselves. It's interesting in the last, you know, probably 20 years, if there's anything that we've learned in the Western church is that we're not good at handling glory. If you don't believe me, think about the last scandal you heard about, and the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that. People put up on pedestals. Slowly but surely, taking a little bit of glory here, a little bit of glory there, a little there. And guess what? We don't know how to handle that kind of glory. And it destroys us and it hurts us. And God's intention has always been, it's not about you. I'm not a doctor or a medical health professional, but I've got to be brutally honest with you. I've wondered this recently. If I didn't have God in my life, if I felt like life was all about me and I, what I could get out of it, I, I felt like I had to look after myself, provide for myself, be number one, make all the right choices. If, if, if I lived in that space where I didn't believe there was a God that loved me, that cared for me, that has my best intentions, has my back that I could talk to, that I could pray, if I didn't believe any of that and it was all on me, with the complexities of the world right now, I would probably be struggling massively. Because I don't think we were ever created to have to feel like We've got to look completely after our own selves. Adam and Eve knew God was there. They made a dumb choice, but they were created in an environment where it was natural to know that there was a Father in heaven that was looking down upon them. We're not made to live in that space where life is about creating our own glory. We're meant to live in a place where we glorify God. That's the object and goal of our life. Anyone ever watch the Academy Awards? Come on, you good Christians. I never watch the Academy Awards. I bet you never listen to secular music either, right? Oh, no, we don't know. Just spirit. We need to live our lives as if we are going after the Best Supporting Actor Award. You know that one? Who won Best Supporting Actor the last 10 years? Most people don't know. Because as far as the world's concerned, we don't really care too much about Best Supporting Actor. Come up, get your trophy. That's okay. We'll clap you. But then a couple of days later, no one's talking about the Best Supporting Actor. Who are we talking about? Best actor, right? But here's the challenge for us. We're not called to live our lives as if we're trying to get the best actor award. We should be going for the best supporting actor award. Because the big gong goes to God, amen? The big man goes to him. God is the one. And this is a battle for many believers when it comes into entering into all that God has for us living in the fullness of God, being that kind of person where, as Jesus said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I think one of the reasons why we never get to that point of being that person where the Spirit of God flows through us is probably because at some point we haven't made the decision, answered the question, am I living for the glory of God or am I still seeking the glory of man? Jesus lived 100% for the glory of God and we read the stories. 
The early church lived for the glory of God, and we read about the miraculous stuff, which was really just the Spirit of God, that living water flowing through them, coming out of them and flowing into the world around them. But they'd settled the issue back then. They're living for the glory of God. Somewhere in the last 2,000 years, I wonder whether it's gotten a little bit fuzzy, a little bit tainted. Maybe it just seems a little bit too radical to live your whole life for the glory of God. Maybe it just seems like a fable or a distant memory, something that's too difficult. But I believe that we can live that way. We can actually live where our whole life is lived for the glory of God. So whose glory are you living for? There's a really, really sad story, and I'll finish with this, in John chapter 12. If you read the book of John, we read about these miracles, things that are happening. And then uh, in in John chapter uh, 12 here, towards the back end, uh, John summarizes. He's summarizing the ministry of Jesus up to that point. That's what he's doing. And in summarizing the ministry of Christ up to this point, he makes this statement, John 12, 42 to 43. He says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They believed, but there was something that stopped that living water that had flowed into them from flowing out of them. And he goes on and he says, here's why that living water could flow to them. They could believe, but they couldn't bring themselves to a space where it flowed out of them. It says, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. What were they living for? They were living for their own glory and not the glory of God. Not the glory of God. Last week, we asked for wisdom. Well, I think the wisest thing we could do is to live a life that gives all the glory to the one who created us, the one who saved us, the one who's for us, the one who brought us back, the one who gave us the opportunity to have a relationship with him again, the one who sent his son to die for us on the cross, the one who gave you the first breath you took this morning and the last breath you're going to take before you go to sleep. Actually, hopefully there's another breath after that because I don't want you dying in your sleep. So that's the question. Who, whose glory do you live for? Up until this week, I never really thought about it, if I'm brutally honest. I just never thought about it. But I must be honest, I've been running through my life in these last few days, looking at different areas of my life. Why do I do this? And also, why don't I do that? And if I'm brutally honest, there's, a, there's an element of me that's still living for my own glory. I don't want that. I want to live for the glory of God totally. 100% completely. And if you're anything like me and you're sitting here this, this, this morning and you're going, you know what, I connect with that. And, and, and you're right. I, 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 the reason that that living water's not flowing out of me is I, I probably haven't 100% definitively made that decision. I want to live for the glory of God and I'm still chasing a little bit of my own. I'll be the first one to stand up, put my hand up and say, that's me. If there's anybody else here this morning and you feel like that connects with you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. And I want to pray with you and for me and for us all. Uh, Last week, as I said, we asked for wisdom. Well, I can't think of anything wiser than making the decision. You know what, God? I I want to see those areas of my heart where I'm not living for your glory, but I'm still chasing glory uh, uh, for myself or or, or living for the praise of man or whatever. God, I want my life. That, 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 That crack in the wall there, people. We talk about it all the time. That's your human existence. It is not a long time. It's not a long time. And God was moving before I got here. He'll keep going afterwards. But this life is almost like a divine invitation. Would you live for the very purpose that I created you? As I said in Isaiah, I created you for my glory. Would you accept that invitation and would you choose to live that way? So anyway, I'm going to pray right now. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you just to stand to your feet. And uh, we're going to pray and finish up. After that, we've got some tea and coffee next door and hang around. We can have a chat and so on. But uh, I'll be the first one to say... There are parts of my heart where I am still seeking my own glory. There are areas of my life where I'm still not completely going after him. But I want that living water to flow through me. Jesus said it's not enough just to get it. He said the goal is not just to get that living water in you. The next step is to let it flow through you. So, Father, I pray. God, I I lift my own hand. I pray for myself and every person in this room that's standing right now. Father, I pray, God, search our hearts. Lord, we all love you. We've all given our lives to you. We all have the spirit within us. We know that. We believe that. And God, there's not one person standing in this room that doesn't want to give you all the glory. But Father, we are human and things have happened in our lives. 
Things have shaped us, God. And so, Father, I pray that you would begin to speak into each of our hearts. Show us why it is that we find it hard to give you the glory in these areas. Why is it in these areas that we maybe still continue, God, to, to pull glory into our own lives? What's the deficit? What's the hole that we're trying to fill that we can't seem to pass it on to you? Because, Father, we want to be those people you spoke about. We want to have that living water not just in us, God, but we want it to flow through us as a stream, God, into our families, into our marriages, into the relationships we have with our kids, Lord, into our workplaces, our universities, our schools, God. Lord, we want it to flow into our neighbourhoods, our streets, God. We want it to flow into our community, our city, our nation, God. And so, Father, search our hearts, speak to us, take us on a journey, Lord. Because, God, we want to give you all of the glory, Father. And together we pray and we all say, Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. God bless you guys.